Happy Friday, everyone. This is David I here in Scotts Valley, California. Welcome to Developer Direct, and Anders Olson is here. Hello. You can also take part in the uh, conversation. We have a, a Twitter feed. We ask everyone to use the hashtag EMBTDD, and you can also follow the account at EMBTDDirect, and so you can put things up on Twitter. Uh, you can also send emails to us. We get those occasionally, and they come to all of us, all the Developer Direct team, as well as several members of our support and sales organization. So if you have questions after the fact, developerdirect.online at marketer.com is the email address uh, to use uh, after the fact. This is where we are. This is the last regular topic-based episode for this quarter's Developer Direct. We're kicking around having kind of a summer school if you're in the Northern Hemisphere and a winter school uh, if you're in the Southern Hemisphere uh, during sort of a little bit of July and August, more of a workshoppy kind of thing. So stay tuned for news about all of that. Next week we have the season finale. I'll be just back from uh, Seattle. I'm in Denver and Seattle next week. And Anders, you're at the Apple WWDC next week. Woohoo! I was That's correct. I was seven. You have to be sending us like notes in real time. Uh, and all yeah, stuff. of course. We're, it's rumored about OS OS eleven, maybe OS I'm, XI. There's all kinds of rumors yeah. about all kinds of stuff. And iOS seven, maybe, and and maybe a flatter look. A lot of the schedule will be uh, unveiled uh, at the last minute. Yeah, all it is right now is tracks, right? It's tracks for WWDC. There's lots of sessions that say uh, session to be announced. So okay. it's obvious that you know the keynote will trigger something, I'm sure. Anyway, if you think that WWDC is going to be cool, you should check out a Code Rage Mobile, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And that's the week after. That June 18th and 19th. And some people on the road were asking me, well, how are you guys going to keep up if, if Google announces new stuff and Apple announces new stuff? Uh, we're on top of it. That's why uh, Anders and others are going to be at WWDC next week. Uh, that's why we all do beta testing. And we also have lots of friends over the years, some ex-employees and so on that are working at Google, working at Apple. And the other thing is somebody said, well, what if they do this new look? Uh, we've dealt with that already in the sense in the past by using styles and using bitmap, uh, bitmap controls. Uh, if you remember correctly, the little switchy thing on iOS used to be this rectangular kind of thing, and now it's this kind of roundy kind of thing. So, yeah, um, we are on the developer programs, as you probably yeah. know, and we'll get the betas when we get the betas, yeah. and we'll be on there. And if it's, if it's some look and feel things, we can just give you another bitmap style. And if there's new APIs, Anders is the one of several kings of wrapping APIs and showing you how to get at APIs. In fact, he has a session at Courage Mobile uh, all about, well, what do you do if we didn't wrap something with a component and or a nice Delphi function? How do you get to it? And he's been blogging about that, and he'll have a session that helps you with all of that. So no matter what happens, we can show you how to use it, how to call it, how to style it, and then ultimately we'll keep adding components and doing updates and other things as they add new functionality, just as Google did, I think, with a payment system and some other things, although there wasn't much big Android stuff yet in Google I.O. that happened a few weeks ago. Okay, so here's the information about Code Rage Mobile. It's two days. It's going from 6 a.m. to 1 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. That's 1,300 to, two, tw what do you say, 2,000, 2,000 uh, Greenwich Mean Time, which doesn't move ever. 2,000. 2,000. Even though U.K. is on summertime, British summertime right now. Um, 6 a.m. to 1 p.m., all live. And then if you're connected in the Asia Pack, I don't know if you are because it would be like really early in the morning right now. Uh, what we're going to try to do and update the schedule is to do some repeat of the sessions with live Q&A in the early evening here, which would be daytime over in Australia, New Zealand, and Singapore and all those places. So, But in any case, stay tuned. The CodeRage.com will redirect to www.marketero.com slash CodeRage. So two days, some of the sessions will be 30 to 45 minutes. Some of the sessions will be short sessions, like 15, 20 minutes. And we've got a mix of those. Come and register. Go to the coderage.com, register for it. You'll probably get some emails and see some blog posts as well. Uh, Fast Report is available. The latest versions, VCL and FireMonkey, are now available for XE4. And you can, if, if you uh, have XE4, just go to the registered user download area on in Parkadero on Developer Network, and you'll find... Uh, FireMonkey VCL and FireMonkey FMX. And on the Fast Report site, they also have a comparison matrix for each product showing you what's in the Embarcadero edition versus the 
professional edition and so on. They have different editions, basic edition and such. So you can see what uh, what we provide is a registration and purchase incentive, what features are there, and then what else. And Andrew, yeah, we have all our webinars are available for replay on YouTube, uh, including all of these uh, these developer direct sessions. So you can find them, just go to the Embarcador YouTube channel. Um, there's a little YouTube icon off the Embarcador.com page, but I think it's youtube.com slash Embarcadero Tech Net, something like that, T-E-C-H-N-E-T. -E we'll get you there. Uh, last week, yeah, Davis, I, I said you probably just joined uh, that I hadn't edited last week's yet. I apologize. I was traveling this week. I have no other excuse. Anders gave me the camera file, and I just didn't get it done. Uh, these are some URLs for data visualization information and sites that I use all the time uh, just for ideas. There's a lot of infographics there. There's data sets. This, this one out of Switzerland is in my mind is is probably the best, but that's my opinion. Data visualization.ch, uh, ch meaning Switzerland. I don't know why it's ch. Um, that's its two character top level domain designation. Yeah, I, sh I should remember that. You should. I don't should. right now. You're from Sweden, which is close to Switzerland. It has SW to start it. Yeah, there you go. Anyway, data visualization.ch has. Uh, news, examples, tools, data sets, a whole bunch of stuff. I use it all the time. And if you're into infographics and data visualization, that's a great one. There's also a visualizing community where people share their ideas, uh, share examples and, and data sets and other things, uh, visualizing.org. And as an example of one, pl one uh, type, there was a Swedish stat statistician. I keep forgetting his name, but he did the... Uh, he did a document, docu documentary on the art of statistics, and he also did a TED Talk, and uh, he showed how he used, in his case, he used Adobe Air and, and uh, Adobe gra Graphics to let you look at data, and he, he was trying to find, he actually does research in things like HIV infections in Africa and so on, and he was trying to relate different statistics together uh, visual uh, first in spreadsheets, but then visually, the idea of maybe literacy, the literacy level or the age in a country or the gross domestic, gross national product, uh, gross domestic product GDP, how that might relate to uh, to health or life expectancy, and the World Bank has a whole set of of databases and interfaces through REST calls that you can use to get data on all sorts of things like. Uh, education level, um, life expectancy, uh, birth rates, uh, death rates, uh, consumption of energy, production of energy, uh, per capita GDP, and so on. Oh, so, so I just, just found a oh. Swiss thing here. It's uh, Confederatio Helvetica or something like that. It's the, from the uh, Latin. Yeah, it's uh, the Helvetian Confederation. Yeah. Goes uh, way back. Okay. So, and Google has a similar thing. They call it the Google Public Data Explorer. So you can go there and look at a, a 2D graphic example of, of relating two different uh, data sets to each other and see visually how, how they're related. Maybe it's GDP and education level, for example. Um, also, next week, there's going to be an awesome, awesome webinar at 6 a.m., 11 a.m., and 5 p.m. next Wednesday uh, by Serena DuPont. It's your mobile UI should be as awesome as your code is the title. And what Serena is going to do is, is give you tips on how to design your mobile user interface using the designer, using Delphi XZ4 for iOS and iPad and iPod Touch 4th generation and above. And so uh, join it. There's the short form uh, URL uh, to register. And the short form URLs are case sensitive. So remember the M and the U, the I, and the W are all uppercase uh, in that short form. You won't want to miss it. Of course, it'll be recorded as well, even though you're at WWDC maybe and I'm in Seattle, but we'll uh, we'll figure all that out. But Serena has been looking at all this. Anders, of course, has applications that he's made it through the gauntlet of Apple's uh, crystal ball. I don't know, maybe they use that eight ball, magic eight ball with little cube inside of it and you they decide yes or no, you're gonna, your app's going to be accepted in the App Store. I I don't know. I'm sure they have uh, they have all their UI guidelines. They do, and they have a big team, and and uh, sometimes it takes a long time. Sometimes it takes is quick. 
Okay. Uh, and I've I've never been able to figure out from outside the black box. It's really hard to do. Uh, figure out exactly what's going to go fly fast and what's going to fly slow. So come to Serena's webinar next Wednesday, and you'll get lots of tips of how how to get the most out of the UI and also have a really good chance of of making it through. Uh, the submission process if you want to take your mobile app and submit it to the App Store. Also, there's uh, a, a couple weeks ago, JT and myself and Anders, actually, you were traveling or you were somewhere. Where were you? You were somewhere. Uh, Mexico City, oh, that's Guadalajara. Right. He, was, he was in Mexico City in Guadalajara. Um, but JT and Steve and I did a role playing uh, and demonstrations of starting with an idea for a, a recipe app, for example, this case. Uh, this, of course, they're showing a travel agent, which is another showcase app we have. And and starting from the beginning, building a, building the prototype UI with the customer there, uh, then listening to the customer and, and refining it, refining it until we had a final uh, interface light-based uh, multi-tab uh, uh, iOS application that was that would allow you to put in regist- uh, recipes and edit recipes and favorite recipes. That way... Steve's uh, restaurant chain, he could deploy the database and the application after the chain so they can know how to build, you know, the, the right meals. And then the local chefs could also add their own recipes into the system. So we went through that, and that's in the rapid prototype webinar replay that's available. Okay. And then the replays uh, over in, in the UK, they've set up a streaming server, and, uh, and all of the developer direct replays are showing up over there as podcasts from a streaming server. Uh, but we also have them on YouTube. This is just a test server for now. The goal is to have everything that we ever do also available as podcasts that you can subscribe to and bring them down to your devices, your desktop, and so on. So streaming.marketer.com, check that out. And always, uh, all the samples for exe 4 and exe 3 and exe 2 and exe are on SourceForge, and here's the long-form uh, um, URL for that, for the exe 4 version. So Everything that we ship in the product as samples and iOS code snippets and so on, they're always updated in SourceForge. You can even right mouse click in your samples folder, and if you have a a, an, a subversion client, uh, you can constantly be doing updates. Yeah, maybe we should ask Tim for a short URL for that yeah. one too. Okay. Otherwise, you can search for Rad Studio Demo SourceForge XE4 something like that. Yeah. And and you'll find it. One last thing here is we've we've joined up with the Mac and Cloud people. Mac and Cloud is is a set of Macintoshes that are sitting in on in a server farm, and it allows you if you don't have a Macintosh to be able to test at least using the iOS simulator from your ID to a Macintosh. They have a uh, they've installed the PA server, and it's sitting there on their servers on each of their on each of their machines, and you 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 pay for time. Uh, as you go. So if you want to test and you don't have a Mac, uh, you can do this in a cloud infrastructure. And there's uh, special information. Just go to embt.co slash Mac and cloud, all lowercase in that case. And it'll give you more information about it. Instant trial is there. If you haven't tried XE4 yet, uh, we have two ways. There's the full download, of course. But there's an instant trial. If you click on it, it starts streaming down using our AppWave technology. It starts streaming the installed version of XE4, and within about 10 or 11 minutes, you'll see the splash screen, and you can start creating your first VCL application, and within about the first 15 minutes, you can start building your first uh, iOS application, and then it sits there in the background and caches and brings back down more of the ID, uh, either as you choose a certain option or as you want to have the whole trial ultimately on your hard drive. So it's a great way to just get started quickly. The other way is to download um, a couple gigs of the trial and then install it and then start using it. This way you only have to wait 10 to 15 minutes before you can actually start creating a project. So check out the instant trial if you haven't done the trialing of XE4. And everything else that is happening, we have an events page off the off the home page to keep up on live events, face-to-face events like what Al was doing this week, what I did, what I'm happening, what's happening next week. And I think, Andrews, you're going to Boston and somewhere else. Salt Lake. And Salt Lake City the week after next as well. All right, so data visualization, engineering, scientific graphics, today's theme and topic. Lots of things going on in data visualization. A great way, what is it, a picture is worth a thousand data points, something like that, or a picture is worth a thousand words. So there's lots of different ways to do data visualization. Also scientific visualization, looking at molecules, looking at uh, 
atomic structures, looking at crystals or whatever it might be. There's, there's lots of different ways to think about how you would visualize a scientific process or some kind of chemical process and so on. The great thing is FireMonkey gives you access to all the graphics you need, both 2D and 3D graphics, to be able to do all sorts of different visualizations. Especially in 3D uh, with FireMonkey, uh, it works with, op with Direct 3D on on Windows, OpenGL on Mac, and OpenGL ES on uh, on iOS. So we hook right in. We hook into the GPU. We can push a lot of the bitmaps. We can push the pixel shader code. We can push other things into the GPU and let it do a lot of the work. And then it comes back and shows up on your screen. It offloads the CPU, so your CPU can do more of the work that you need to do. And so how you do that is there's a 3D architecture set of, of classes and at the highest level abstraction level just the context for 3D and then whatever system you're on whether you're on Windows with DirectX 9 or, or DirectX 10 or you're on Macintosh or iOS uh, you get, it gives you the right lower level implementation of the APIs for those 3D 3D systems. You just work at the highest level with these 3D shapes and components. We have lots of different ones. You'll see Anders playing around with custom mesh today. Uh, you'll see me look working with an extruded shape 3D, a uh, T-Path 3D uh, in a demo. We have 3D controls, grids. Anders puts a grid on along with his custom mesh uh, so you can see sort of axes in, in X, Y, and Z. So lots of controls, and ultimately it, it's a component uh, in the hierarchy. So lots of things that are available in FireMonkey 3D and also in 2D, so a circle versus a sphere, uh, a rectangle instead of a 3D rectangle, and so on. And then there's some other objects that allow you to not only manipulate the objects, for example, a generic container uh, called T-Dummy, um, so that you can rotate all the objects inside of this container uh, as you're moving the camera around. So we have camera support, light support, uh, material support, so you can put material, either a bitmap or a picture or whatever the material file might be on top of the 3D surface. All of that is supported in FireMonkey uh, and gives you a lot of capability. You'll see that in the demos today as well. All right, and in fact, we're at the demos. So here I'm in the XE4 IDE, and I want to bring. I'm going to bring a couple different demos. Uh, Pavel Glavatsky uh, created this molecules demo, and what the molecules demo does is it takes a uh, a database, there's different, there's the standard database for for documenting molecules, strong bonds, weak bonds, atoms, and so on as part of molecules. And so he has built this 3D application and he's using the transparent style on Windows, which gives you this nice see-through kind of arc dialers and uh, and a button and check boxes and so on. He's got a a dummy and the dummy is just there so he can create things inside of it and then he's got animations to move around. He's got another dummy that has a camera associated with it and a light associated with it. So here's the light. Uh, and so you can shine a spotlight on it to light the object, or you could set the, uh, the material source information so that the objects can emit their own light, or they have to be lighted by a light. And again, you can have a camera as a non-visual component so that instead of moving all the objects around in 3D space, I mean, you can do that as well. You can move their position X, Y, and Z, but you can also move the camera. And that as the camera points to, for example, a container, as you move around, and you'll see this in Anders' demo ultimately in the, in the math visualization component or application, uh, he'll move the camera around and instead of having to rotate the whole, the whole set of, of 3D objects. He's got a style book here, and the style book he's got loaded to bring up this beautiful style, and a f an open dialog to load up the the uh, the f these molecular files, one per file, and he's got just uh, an action list so that he can create actions that are associated with the operations. If we look at the source code, there's you know not much here other than he creates the atomic material. Um, he sets the caption for what the name of the molecule is. Uh, if you if you move the mouse around, you can rotate. Uh, he's got a viewport 3D viewport 3D inside of a two inside of an HD application allows you to put 3D objects into a viewport, put that viewport onto a, a 2D or, or HD surface of FireMonkey application. 
Uh, the reason we, we do that sometimes is you might have some 2D operations. I think, Anders, you probably have a viewport as well, so you can have these kind of control panels. Sometimes you put a panel on top of a 2D area, and then you put a viewport and do all the 3D operations in the viewport. Uh, yeah, mine are both 3D forms. So, totally 3D forms. So I'm putting uh, my control panels on on layouts. and on a, lay a layer 3D? Yeah. No, I think so, yeah. Yeah. So you can do it either way. You can have a 2D application that has 3D in it, or you can have a 3D application that has a layer uh, or other surfaces, and you can put 2D components on those layers. Yeah. It really depends if your application is mainly 3D or just a little bit of 3D. Yep. So in his case, he's got a uh, a, uh, a viewport 3D that's occupying this part. The upper looks like about three quarters or seven eighths of the of the surface of the form, and then down here in the bottom, he's got the rest of that being 2D. And so let's let's look at this in action first. Let's run it on Win32. I think that's what he's got this one set up for. So here's uh, the surface. We'll load up a PDB file. So I usually start with caffeine because that's what I'm drinking right now, caffeine. Uh, but maybe other people like cold caffeine with bubbles or Diet Coke or Coca-Cola or something like that. So what we've got here is we've got a track bar, and the track bar, we're simply going to move the, the camera around. So it looks like the object actually is going off in the distance. We're moving the camera away from the set of 3D objects by moving the track bar around. And then we can use these arc dialers to rotate around the X, Y, and Z axis. Or here's the X axis. Here's the Y axis. And here's the Z axis. And then he's got two check boxes turning off. There's just the bonds, for example, and then show the atoms uh, turning off the bonds and just show the atoms floating in space. And it looks like he's got an auto rotate option, which is pretty cool. Here, let's blow it uh, back up again. Okay, so now let's go back again to uh, to a couple of these components. Let's go to the uh, track bar scale changer. The track bar scale change, all it's doing is it's, remember the dummy is the container that's containing all these objects that are created, these spheres and lines that are created as he parses the PDB file. And we just go and we, we scale the X, Y, and Z for the dummy. And that lets us zoom in and out. Uh, I guess he could have used a camera. looks like he's not using the scale factors in, uh, in this case. Uh, also for rotation, we look at the arc dialers, for example. Arc dial X change, he's just changing the rotation angle of the dummy, which contains all the objects that are created from the database file, and he's just taking the value, the arc dialer, the X value, the Y value, the Z value, or sorry, the value of each of the arc dialers and setting the X, Y, and Z rotation angle of the dummy. And then let me go over here to the open dialog box. And uh, he's got a filter just looking for PDB files. How is he? Oh, it's on the load. Okay, sorry. Button click. We say if we actually select a file, then open it up, get the file name, get a mo like molecule. He's got a function, helper function he's got that returns the molecule. And then he, uh, he just creates a, a child for the molecule, it looks like, or the, uh, for each of the molecules down in this model view. And he's got a material uh, for each, I guess, for carbon and, and whatever. Let's see where these are defined. I haven't looked through all of this before. But he's got uh, at atomic materials, and, uh, and he's got the molecules. And a molecule looks like, let's take this one. Um, Molecule's got a, a list of atoms, a list of bonds, and a procedure to clear. So that's uh, a simple visualization uh, of molecules. Let me bring up a different one. And again, all the source code uh, Pavel's going to blog about, he'll put the source code up for you. Uh, some time ago, I did a, an example. Let's run this on uh, Windows 2. This one takes uh, uh, uses TPath 3D. Uh, for the layout of the states of Brazil, of the country of Brazil. So I found a, a SVG file, and inside the SVG file, there's the path data for each of the states. And I took that path data, 
uh, which defines either moving to a location, drawing part of a line, or drawing a Bezier curve, and then moving to another location, and so on. I took that path data, I stored it into a text blob in an interbase database, and then when I open the database, I read the TPATH data and names of states and so on, and uh, I create the outlines and I color. So I have a color array, and I assign the different states different colors so that we can see them. So these are the states there. Yeah, that's a little bug I'm I'm working on. Go away. It'll go away eventually. Really, honestly. There we go. Um, so each of the states. And then I have another table in the states database that has population over time, starting with 1872. They did census, just like some countries do, on an irregular basis early on and then on a, a bigger basis later on. So as I move this track bar down 1890, you'll start seeing the, uh, the states extruding out. And what I'm doing here is setting the depth of the TPATH 3D object uh, on a scale factor of the population. And you'll see that, that the one that's coming out the furthest is the most populous state. It's the Sao Paulo, the state of Sao Paulo, where all the finance, a lot of the big business takes place. And so that comes up and we can we can move them back and down and, and we can then I use an arc dialer to rotate things and to move things right and left and so on. So in this case I've got a viewport three D on the right and I've got a uh a couple of uh, layouts on the left-hand side that I stick some controls in. I stole that code from Andrews. He's got that in his visualization example. So the code underneath here is pretty simple. I just create a bunch. So I read through the database, and I create a path 3D and have it associated with, uh, with, the, uh, with the viewport. And then I set its projection, and I set a... Uh, uh, the path data, so the path data comes from the field, which is the, which is the uh, text blob, and I put the path data in the in the 3D that I just created, the three the T path 3D, and I set the x and get the x and y of the bounded rectangle around the state, set the height and width. I start with the depth being zero, meaning all the states are flat, so that I'm they have no population. And then I do the, uh, I set the material source and the shaft source and the back source. Uh, in this, I have these material source objects that I create, and they're in the they're in the state array, or the state of disarray. And then eventually, at the end, I set the index for population to the first entry in the array, and I say set state population depth, and set state population depth. Uh, just uh, gets does a query of the data for the state that I'm in, and I set the depth equal to the population uh, divided by the scale factor, and I set the position z to be half of that. Because if I set the whole depth, that's the whole height of the TPATH 3D, it would actually extrude in both directions from the center point. So in my case, I just want it to come out, and so negative z um, will bring the state's position out from the center of the screen. So x grows to the right in FireMonkey 3D, a y grows down, y positive is down, and positive z is into your screen. So I want to set the negative z to bring each of the states as I move through the, uh, the population years. And that's how that... Uh, that example works. Let me bring up another way to do business data visualization is to use T-Chart Lite. T-Chart Lite and then T-Chart from Stima. Uh, T-Chart Lite is a subset of the T-Chart for FireMonkey, and it also works It works with Windows, Mac, and now with iOS. So here I've got a mobile project, um, and I've got a, a T-Chart stuck into it, and I've got uh, a button to load some data, and uh, a place to put the axes information, uh, a data series, and a group series, and all of this is supported inside of the chart itself. And then we name this container as chart. And since you could parent anything to anything, this button is paint parented to the chart uh, for for getting data and 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 also adding an additional x y. And underneath the code, it just says. Series one, that's the name of the data series inside the chart. Add one, give it a value, give it a, 
a label and give it a, a color and then some random data if you want to add other data points on that second button just to call series add x y give it an x, x and y value so let's look at this one one thing the other say is this in the design is the is how you lay out in the designer you can choose in the designer for mobile what device you want to have it look like in the designer but that has nothing to do specifically with how it'll show up once it's on the device or the simulator um, it's just so you can have a frame of reference uh, as you're as you're building and designing the layout of your application if I go to project options and I go to application here's where I have all my icons for the device desktop retina non retina for the launch image you know splash screen spotlight search if you're on an iOS and you search for applications you'll get little icons showing up you have bitmaps for iPad here's where you can set orientation you can also do it in code you can fix the orientation In this case we wanted to have this application only work in landscape mode where home is at the left hand side and so cu custom orientation is chosen here the other thing you can and we could have had it be a floating orientation or a standard whatever the default orientation which is portrait on a on a phone device the other thing on the target options is that you can choose how to start the simulator Do you want to start it as an iPhone 5 an iPhone 4 or earlier or an iPad so I have it so the simulator starts it with iPhone and you'll see in a moment how we can change that once we're in the simulator of course when you have a device it's a device so I didn't want that to uh, flip in in different directions because of the data so here's our here's our data and up here in the simulator you can always choose the device as well on your hardware device you can choose which version uh, of the simulator you want it to use we support iOS 5.1 and greater but in my case I installed uh, the simulator for 5.0 as well rotate left rotate right simulate a shake gesture under debug you can also uh, simulate location based so you can test your location apples I've got my location set to Apple but here we can use t-chart to visualize business data in many different charting ways and there's a gallery of charts that are built in and then you can go to Stima software and they have uh, hundreds of other charts in their professional and their other editions so if you if you want to do business charting to visualize applications you can do that uh, let's see what they have here uh, edit chart the charts they have are let's see where I can choose the charts mm -hmm. oh, I used to be able to do this why can't I find it now chart oh, it says upgrade standard pro for 100% source code okay I can't find where the other chart types are hmm. all right anyway there are several that are built in 2d and 3d charts uh, in addition and T chart light is also as I if I didn't say it is also available for Windows and Mac fire monkey and also uh, T chart I think for VCL as well uh, built in T chart light and then go to steam software to get uh, get more um, source code and so on all right one last I think oh this is one last visualization I, I put this in the sort of the heading of glanceable user interface and what this one does is I have a database of market indexes around the world the Nikkei 225 the Dow Jones Industrial uh, index uh, lots of different indexes and I have those in a database and then I build a a, a, a list a, a list box up of items and and have a glanceable ellipse that shows up so in the source code I'm simply uh, going through the database of my stock index uh, database and I get the name and the URL of the stock uh, indicator and then I create a list box item for each entry in the stock database and I create its height and width and set its padding of its margins and so on then I create an ellipse and the ellipse is an indicator I use for is the stock market index up down or unchanged and so I create an ellipse I parent it to this list box item and then I set some other properties like its alignment and its color and so on uh, the label for the market indicator I just create a label and I make its parent the list box item that I just created and also I have a little change indicator a plus and minus sign uh, that is another label that I create add to the list box item and then for that new list box item I created 
I call begin update and then I call add object to put the three objects into the list box and then end update. That way they all just appear at once. And then I also take that list box item that I created that has these parented controls into it and I call add, add object inside of a begin and end update. And then I go to the next query, the next query, the next query. And then finally I have a timer as you open up that goes and gets the stock index uh, information and updates the status based on what's happening. So let's just take a look at this on the simulator. In this case, I've got iPad, I think, chosen as the simulator target versus iPhone. I wanted a bigger, glanceable interface. And so here comes the splash screen. Here's the simulator. Where's my... Oh, sorry. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to track, hit track. Track just opens up the database. And then on X number of seconds intervals, it's going through every couple seconds, and it's looking at the different stock. Now, this is... This is not live data. This is sample data that I'm generating just to show the index. But I'll, I'll put this up somewhere. And if you have paid access to stock market indicator values, for example, then you'll, uh, you can put that in the database, um, the URLs and so on that you have access to to get real live data if you want this as a glanceable. The asterisk just says that something changed since the last interval. So we can go up here. And this is a number box, so I can actually select it and drag and drag along uh, with the mouse or I can change it to some other interval but oh, that's going to take a long time that's a five well okay so maybe it'll slow it down and so in any case it's just sitting there looking for something that's changed in the stock market index so it's a, just a little example of a of a glanceable interface visualizing mathematical functions by generating custom meshes using FireMonkey uh, this is an article I wrote for uh, with Delphi XC2 and also actually C++ Builder XC2 uh, and FireMonkey. We're just going to go through it here. I've ported it to XC4 um, real quick uh, just to give it a refresh. So essentially you can put in your own uh, mathematical function of two variables and it will plot a uh, volume for you. So the article here goes through, uh, you can see the article number here. I can highlight the whole thing. There we go. Article 42007. So I talk about how to generate the mesh and how we're looping from uh, over uh, X and Z uh, to generate the Y values. Uh, so obviously here each square becomes two triangles and triangles is what a mesh is made up of. So this goes into discussing a little bit of the code, how we compute these four values, and then we make up the uh, triangles. The first triangle is P1, P2, P3. Uh, the second one is P3, P0, P1. So those are the three points for each triangle. And this is the code for it. And then we generate the texture. This talks a little bit about how to generate the texture. This is uh, XE2 code. Uh, so we'll see in the source code for the new one how this is uh, generated in XC4 now. Uh, the other stuff is pretty much the same. Uh, we set the vertex buffer and create the triangles and all that kind of stuff. And here are the functions and uh, all of the code. And the demo application has got some screenshots here of all the different uh, surfaces that I have in this particular demo. So if we go to the IDE and we load up my MathViz project here, if we click on the uh, button here and go to generate mesh, here's the new code for manipulating uh, bitmap. So now, what you have to, since a bitmap is stored by default on the GPU, in order to get read-write access to it, we have to map the actual bitmap uh, to a tbitmap data instance. So that's my BMP data here. Then, instead of uh, doing that other code, we simply call set pixel instead of setting uh, pixel colon equals or something like that, or pixel array. There's a function call, and we pass in the same exact value. So this line just changes slightly. Instead of being uh, an 
index into an array that we assign something to, we pass in x and y and the actual value. And finally, we unmap it, which means we put it back on the GPU and we're uh, ready to use it. So if we run this on Win32 here, go full screen. Here we just generated uh, something like 50,000 points uh, on this mathematical function. Uh, just like David had there, uh, the spinning code, you can spin this guy around, around all three axes uh, like this. You can zoom in and out like so. You can reset it to what we had originally. We can go with other functions. If you want to see what the function looks like, we can hit custom function, and this is what it does here. We can put in a different value uh, and generate a new function. So, for instance, say, let's say 3,000, and it just becomes a little more extruded in this particular case, right? And the colors change slightly because the colors are depending on the value of the function. We can turn off, uh, make it uh, transparent and turn off the grids and a little bit of other stuff. The cool thing, of course, is here that we can go to Mac OS, uh, Mac OS 10 here as well by just simply retargeting and recompiling and rebuilding it. And it, now it runs over here on Mac OS 10. Oh. Nice, these uh, are the webinar windows that you probably don't see. This is smart enough not to broadcast its own windows, but same thing happens here. You'll notice that it goes um, probably a little faster on, uh, on the Mac because uh, that is the native platform on this MacBook. And we have all the different uh, functions here as well. You can do the custom function uh, here as well, do a Minus two, make it a little smaller, like that. Pretty simple little application. Now we can take a look at, okay, we want to change some stuff over time. So maybe a physics um, simulation or something like that. And for that, I have my uh, wave simulator. We'll start on Windows. We'll just run it, see what it does. And in the past, I used the same uh, the same bitmap for the waves here, but now I figured since it's a wave simulator, why not use the ocean? So here's a picture of the ocean. And when we start um, turning on the waves here, we see that we have a wave origination point here. We have a certain um, amplitude, wavelength, and velocity. We can change the velocity so we go uh, faster. If we instead decided to change the wavelength, there's a longer wavelength, shorter wavelength. Uh, we can change the amplitude. And of course, we can change all of them at the same time. It becomes more fun uh, when we enable other points here as well, because now we get uh, waves uh, superimposed on each other. So now we have three different points, one in each corner, and there are uh, participating here. We can, of course, change all of these values and see what's happening. All right, now we've got a crazy wave going on here. It's a full-on storm. All right. And this also uh, runs on the Mac. Retarget that and, and put it over here. And uh, we're on the Mac. And we can turn on wave one, wave two, change the values a little bit, see what's happening. So there's the uh, wave simulation. It's so cool, Anders. Before he just had a color. The source. same thing as math yeah. is. I just had the, yeah. the different uh, temperature essentially. Yeah, but now he's got actually put a wave bitmap material source on it. It looks so cool, Anders. So this is just the uh, mesh uh, material source here. I hook it up at runtime to this resource here, which is uh, one under bar ocean .jpg, um, which was a freely available uh, picture of the. Uh, of an ocean or a lake somewhere. Um, and this is very, very similar. I have a group of waves, uh, an array of waves or uh, array of records here 
Um, this is the uh, record. A T wave is either enabled or disabled. It's got an amplitude. It's got a wavelength. It's got a position x y, uh, and it's got a velocity. And then I set up four different uh, waves uh, from the beginning, and then of course generating the wave is a matter of uh, computing the uh, wave function and adding it into the results so we superimpose correctly. Uh, t as in time is a function of this variable, or is a variable of this function rather, and then we have the pretty much the exactly the same code uh, to generate uh, the mesh. And every iteration we force a repaint so that actually updates. And then the uh, uh, zooming in and zooming out and turning around and twisting and uh, that kind of stuff works exactly the same. So those are the two uh, data visualization things uh, that I wanted to show today. Excellent, Anderson. Oh, this is really cool. And I know you've had uh, previous versions. Off your, you linked off your blog, and they were either in Code Central or somewhere, right? The source code. Uh, yeah, I believe so. Um, okay. If not, I'll double check and I'll uh, make sure they're put updated. it out there for sure. Yeah. Um, and why not uh, uh, show this as well? This is the uh, XE2 application as it is in the. Uh, in the app, store. app store, so uh, slightly different UI, but roughly the same. You can spin around here. I cl I'm clicking on the, uh, can't tell, but I'm clicking on the same um, buttons up here. Yeah, he's using uh, each uh, things around. program we built, we, we bought called Reflector. It used to be Reflection, and it uses Air, Apple AirPlay to be able to. Uh, I also have gestures here, so I can spin around. I'm touching yeah. the screen here and spinning it. Yeah, and it lets you. Uh, see what's on your device on the, on the desktop of your Macintosh. The only thing I always keep making the mistake of Anders is I keep clicking on the Mac screen. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's happened to me a couple of, times. Instead sure. of the device, and yeah. nothing happens. And be cool if it worked the other way around, too. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. I think it was available for, we paid $15 for Reflector, and I think Al said he paid twelve ninety nine or something. It's there very cool if you want to be able to see the device. Uh, on your Mac desktop, and we use it for projecting, of course, much easier than sticking a camera on the pointing at the device. Sure. And um, why, if you want me to, I can uh, switch gears a little bit into something that I'm going to show much more detail in Code Rage as yeah. well, which is uh, I've taken my analog clock, I've added ads, and I've uh, added now also in app purchasing, so you can remove the ads um, just to test a few different things and uh, these are things that we didn't wrap out of the box it's not functionality that's in XE4 uh, but a few different community members have contributed to these solutions so <clears throat> you can take just a, a short look at um, what these look like so what I was going to try doing here is um, I launched my analog clock on the screen, and when you when actually the in-app purchasing version is uh, approved, it's uh, they're approved. They're trying to uh, review it right now. So you see the ads at the bottom. They only show up if an ad actually gets filled. I haven't figured out why exactly they don't fill in all countries, but um, that's probably because the uh, advertisers are not paying to be filled in those countries uh, and other different things. Who knows? But so if you're in the uh, free version, so to speak, when you see ads, uh, and in this case it's the development mode, so it only uh, shows um, iAd ads, ads about the iAd framework itself. Now you saw I didn't get filled here, uh, so I, the ad disappeared. But what I can do then is click on this remove ads button if I'm getting tired of ads and I uh, want to give Anders uh, 99 cents or whatever it is. I can click on remove ads here and it comes up and says, confirm your in-app purchase. We're in the sandbox environment, as you can tell here. So it's actually not going to do a transaction. I can say buy. Uh, and now I can sign in or create a new Apple ID. So I'm going to sign in using an existing um, ID. Is it really 99 cents? Or is that and, now you, and now you saw that, yeah. You can set that pricing. You can't actually, and now you saw the remove ad button disappear and everything. Hmm. Uh, and it purchased that uh, functionality. So you and, can set whatever you want, right? And you, price and so on. You can. Uh, you cannot set it to free because the, per, the in app purchases have to cost something. That's the whole point. Um, so one penny. 
No, ninety nine cents, one ninety nine, or oh, wow. two ninety nine, three ninety nine, four ninety nine. There's well, a mul there's tiers for this kind okay. of thing. You're gonna cover all this in Code Rage Mobile. Yeah, in much more detail. Yeah. So can I get gold coins? Can I buy gold coins for your clock or something? Um, eventually, maybe a, maybe a new, maybe a new face. Yeah, maybe uh, buy the functionality, take a picture of something, and put that as a clock face. Who knows? So it. it might add uh, different kinds of things. So and, this was kind of just a little fun thing. And now in-app purchase you. things, the functionality you re has to be in your app, right? Because you can't dynamically load extra code. I mean. Well, there's actually two different ways. There, there's small, uh, there's uh, consumable uh, in-app purchases. Typically, the functionality is already there in your code. Um, You're just turning it, something. But on. it can also be delivered from a server. But then you have to provide the server and the functionality to uh, to download said content. Okay. Um, so you could download bitmaps and whatever else you want. But typically, the functionality is already in there, and you're just guarding it with. Um, you know, testing okay. for whether it's been bought, uh, et cetera. And we'll go into more detail at Code Rage what the code behind it actually looks like. How am I testing on a startup so I don't display ads for some that I already spent 99 cents um, on this okay. uh, and other things. Great. Thanks, Anders. Sure. And this is uh, a reminder of the link. You can also just search, and I think it's just search for MathViz or search FireMonkey, uh, Analog Clock, and you'll find the entry in the iTunes store for getting the math viz. This is the version right now that was built with XE2, but uh, as you saw, Anders has it up to XE4 on Windows and Mac, and he'll, I guess, submitting an update, you just submit it back and say, this is an update to my app, even if it's built with a different technology? Uh, yeah, so here I am in iTunes uh, Connect, <clears throat> which is where you put in your apps. Uh, this is actually not my app. I used it during the beta cycle for uh, R&D used it for testing purposes on my account just to make sure it worked, but it was actually submitted under the Embarcadero account. So here's here's MathWiz uh, 1.1. Oh, I see. They show you different versions. You've got your analog clock 1.4, 1.5. Yeah, 5. so okay. I'll get to – so this one was released um, May 14th, uh, 2012. This one, it was approved. Um, you can see here that it took about a week to approve it, uh, which is fine. Uh, this was an update. Uh, I think I added uh, – um, uh, gestures and things like that to zoom in and out uh, for that particular thing. For Anders Analog Clock here, you see that there's two different versions. One's green, that's the one that's for sale right now that has ads, but it doesn't have in-app purchasing support. The in-app purchasing support is waiting for review. I submitted that on June 2nd right here. And I can go in and manage in-app purchases, and this is how that works. So here my remove ads is actually in review. Uh, I'm finding out how this works. I didn't actually get notifications about uh, this particular in-app purchase being in review. It might have gone into review immediately when I submitted the app. Uh, but anyway, I'm not completely sure how that works or when, or how long it takes. Anyway, that is it. So this will be released as soon as it's uh, the whole thing is reviewed. And um, that's it. Again, there's Anders' app, but you can also search just FireMonkey or FireMonkey and Anders, and you'll see all the different apps, including the Analog Clock. With the, yeah, FireMonkey. I think if you search on FireMonkey, you'll find uh, four different apps, yep. uh, uh, two are mine. For more information, go to Embarcado.com and the Developer Network, and you'll find the YouTube link. Again, it's uh, it's not a hype. We also have the Reviewer's Guide is up there for XZ4. It gives you all what's new in the product and screenshots and little how-tos and so on. Marco's also written a white paper on the Delphi language for mobile development, some things that are in the, the mobile compiler for, for ARM processor and things that'll creep into the other compilers over time. You can just go to our web page for white papers to get to that stuff. Next week is the season finale, so some of you have been sending us suggestions for what we should cover on the season finale, and we'll see what we can do. The idea is we'll recap some of the demos we did in some of the other sessions and things that you've been asking for if we can get them done between now and next Friday. And that's what we'll be doing same time next Friday, June 14th. There's a special offer till the end of the month, 10% off XZ4. Uh, stay tuned for uh, for some great promos. So if you have XZ4, some additional things will show up, like uh, I already mentioned the fast report for VCL and for for FireMonkey, that's in the registered user download area right now. And there's some other things that'll show up next week in the registered user download page for everybody who purchases. So uh, stay tuned for uh, news about all of that showing up on blogs and, and EDN and so on. Or you just periodically go to the registered user download page and you'll see, you'll see what pops up.
as the most recent entries that we've added. We're always uh, hooking up with different technology partners of ours on special offers and also uh, additional, you know, in-market arrow editions of component sets and so on. So always check uh, for new things. Uh, help update one, we didn't have that in the slide, is, is there available, is available in the registered user download page for XE4, uh, an updated help file. Of course, the doc wiki always has the latest stuff. Our doc teams are putting things into doc wiki all the time, and then they, on a monthly or so basis, pull everything out into a Windows help file so that you can update your ID's uh, integrated help in addition to using the web. Somebody asked here about uh, demonstration of doing ad hoc distribution. Uh, it's pretty much exactly the same as, um, I guess, a combination of uh, um, deploying to the store and setting up uh, push notifications. Essentially, you have to uh, create a provisioning profile where you enable all the devices that you're going to test on, and you have to add all the devices up to 100, um, and then um, you just distribute the application with the uh, with the provisioning profile inside your inside your your world inside. Well, your it could be right? public. I mean, it could be public beta testing, but up to 100 devices, and you have right. to convince the beta testers that you need their device ID, yeah. uh, so you can add it to the portal. Uh, but it's not really that different from from um, uh, deploying to the store. Yeah, there's utilities. There's there's uh, iPhone apps that you can. There's several. I don't know how many, 20 or so in the iTunes Store to get the you uh, the device ID and to email and then most of them email it, bring up an email page with the device ID and then you mail it to the person who you who is building software that you want to test for, for example. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, you like can. UDID, there's a whole bunch of them, 20 or 30 of them I found in the iTunes store and, and getting that. That just deploys the device ID, sure. It just gives you the device ID and lets you mail it or yeah. copy it to a notepad and give it to somebody. Yeah, you can uh, also find it. You can see it in uh, in the settings. You can find it in uh, uh, Xcode. In Xcode, if yeah. you plug it in, etc. But yeah, the, an app that displays it is pretty yeah. cool. And we have an enterprise account, I think, that we use internally, right, for a bunch of the developers here, so they can do testing. Yeah, we do in-house in -house distribution, yeah. so everybody can play with the, yeah. you know, performance enhancements. So maybe like we that. can create a video sometime using our own internal account. I don't know. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, but again, it's just like the only. It's just like submitting for the store, except that you're not submitting it to the store. Right, you're submitting yeah. it to your in-house store, in -house if you store. will. Or, yeah, web page, whatever, whatever you have inside. Um, so, Alistair, you have a big, long comment about uh, you're doing PHP. You want to look at native code and some things with MIDI. Uh, what I'm going to do is, Alistair, I'm going to have you send me an email. My, our email addresses are up on the screen. I'm just David I at com. If you want to copy Anders and Al, uh, we'll, I'll, I'll pull this out of the log as well so that it gets a big, long comment about what you're trying to do and Let's see if we can uh, work together and point you in the right direction. In general, what you're talking about doing is there's there's things you can do. I'm not sure specifically about getting from, for example, an iPad to a to a 16 port MIDI box, but there's probably some connector to connect in the phone or the pad, or maybe something over Wi-Fi or some Rust call or something that you can do to get to the from one place to another. Or if you want to do MIDI right inside, we have to look at uh, you know how what goes on with sound files and, and MIDI. I just haven't looked at anything to do with MIDI uh, on the devices themselves. So up here, there's a, on the home page, there's an icon YouTube, which goes to, yeah, Embarcadero TechNet is the URL, youtube.com. Introducing Delphi and, and Rats. Whoa. It, 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 auto, it, always, it always auto starts whatever the current video is. Yeah, Serena took part in this, uh, in this uh, Delphi, uh, yeah. I mean, developer direct. I always say Delphi Direct. I don't know why. And then you can click on videos, and you can uh, go down and look. Here's Developer Direct Episode Six. That's probably the e EMEA version versus the U.S. Canada. I'm not sure uh, some of the different ones, but they're up there. There's also uh, playlists. Uh, let's see. If you go under Upload Playlist, then it'll give you all the playlists. So here's Embarcado Direct 2013. There's playlists for for. Code Rage 7 and for XZ3, XZ4, I did 31 videos for C. So here's Code Rage 7, C. So just look on Embarcadero Technet on YouTube. Uh, that's youtube.com slash user slash Embarcadero Technet, uh, I guess. Or that's the one that will auto start.
So you can go there or put slash U, U-S-E-R slash and then Embarcado TechNet on the end, and that'll get you there. Uh, there was Sandra was asking about video and audio on the device, and, and Sandra, I'll, I'll take a look at that. The team has been working on an update for XZ4, and maybe there's something going on with audio and video on the device, but we'll take a look at the audio and video. Uh, last time I did it, it seemed to work. Let's see, what else? Uh, most of this is just thank you very much and cool on the ads and in-app purchases. So stay tuned. Anders has been blogging about those things. So if I go over to go here and if I go to Anders' blog, which is blogs.marketo.com slash AO, uh, Anders' blog, had reminder about Coderidge Mobile. Here's his in-app purchase update and a look clock. Uh, knows here's uh, IAD already approved, and he's got IAD beta wrapper by Simon Choi, which is he had wrapped the API, and you can go and grab that. It's uh, I used his uh, yeah. existing uh, wrapper. Yep. So it's all in Korean, but you can always uh, convert it to English. Mainly, you go down to the bottom of there's the source code, and he has a, a zip file mm -hmm. that you can grab. And the zip file, uh, if you unzip that, he's got the wrapper for the IAD API, and he's got a little sample program that you can test with. And Anders has a link to that on his blog. So information about Mac Cloud, and then uh, push notification server, which is another session that Anders is doing. And then here's the Code Rage mobile world, thecoderage.com, which redirects to Code Rage. Here's the, the page, marketo.com slash Code Rage, and you just click on the register now. You can look at the sessions, and here's the two days of sessions on Tuesday and Wednesday, lots of mobile sessions and some more sessions to come. This isn't the final word. So join us on the 18th and 19th, or we'll I'll try to get the replays up as soon as possible. Uh, again, the offer is good till the end of the month. Uh, here's our blog stuff. And uh, let's see, XC3 came with slash N, or N software's IP works. N software is, is in the register user download page, Stephen. So if you have XC4 or you're moving to XC4, just go to the registered user download page and you'll see N software code site, Embarcado Edition. There's some other things. Also, when you install, there's a page that comes up that points you to additional downloads. But all of those things are, are still a special promo pieces that are that are add-ons. Um, AQ Time, Embarcado Edition for profiling and so on. Andrew's asking, when will the mobile start for C++ when, uh, when the compilers for ARM get done? We'll keep you posted on... Uh, both C++, iOS, and Android, and we'll keep you posted on Delphi Android as well. The key is to get to XE4. XE4 has FireMonkey 3 and all the platform and device services APIs that we've added since XE3, specifically for, and the rest of the underpinnings that are there for iOS, and then the work has been going on for Andrew. So, sorry, Andrew, there, Andrew, you just popped up. For Android, Android, Andrew, good. Uh, for Android, so that... Uh, the goal is that we'll, you know, if you have maintenance, then we'll you get all the updates in the next 12 months, and all this will be out in, in, uh, in, in a very worthwhile, uh, maintenance-related, a time. But if you, if for some reason you you're thinking you want to wait, well, you can wait, but then you're going to be behind everybody else. Uh, so you can get started today again, just using FireMonkey on Windows and Mac, and using the new the ListView component updates and all the other things that are there. Uh, in XE4 and add maintenance and uh, and then we'll just start delivering updates and beta tests and field tests and and all sorts of things along the way so we're working on it absolutely working on Android and working on the C++ compiler uh, for ARM which is the key to getting us to iOS and Android for C++ and we'll see you all again next Friday for the season finale uh, if you have things you want us to cover or revisit from the previous episodes this quarter, uh, just send us an email. There's our email, or send an email to developerdirect.online at embarcado.com. That way they'll cover all that stuff in uh, in Europe as well, uh, and we'll cover it here uh, in the finale. So see you next Friday, same time, same URL. Take care, everyone.